Hi, uh, my name is uh, Frank Delat and I'm a professor at the Georgia Institute of Technology. And I'll give uh, my bias outlook here on perception in aerial, marine and space robotics. Uh, five years ago, I did a sabbatical at a startup uh, to help them build the most advanced flying AI on the planet, which uh, in my hum humble opinion is the uh, Skydio drone. Uh, and here is a, a product shot of the first version of the Skydio drone. Uh, and what you don't see in this product shot is that there is actually 12 navigation cameras that endow the drone with a full 360 uh, field of view. So it's able to build a model of the environment. So uh, as it is tracking people, its intended uh, application is to track a person who is, who is doing a leisurely activity and create a beautiful video of them. And it can do so while avoiding obstacles in the environment. The uh, second version of the, of the Skydio drone, the Skydio 2, was released earlier this year. Uh, and it innovates in perception in that it now only has six cameras, but these six cameras are uh, much wider in, in their field of view. Um, and they also form a trinocular stereo pair, which uh, gives it better ability to uh, build 3D models. So the way this works, and to deliver value to the customer, uh, the autonomy stack needs to you know, support navigation, tracking, and motion planning, and do it all at a very low uh, power consumption. So it does things like tracking features in the environment, uh, and from that, in, in a sparse slam, uh, real-time slam uh, scenario, uh, deliver a, a trajectory estimate, which then can be can then be built uh, um, up to a full 3D model by, by um, leveraging dense stereo, uh, in this case from the either binocular uh, stereo rigs in the uh, first version or trinocular stereo in the second version. Many of these uh, tasks like navigation, uh, planning, are really core uh, problems in, in robotics and at their heart, they have an optimization problem that is local in nature, okay? And this locality is captured very well with, with factor graphs. And that is my biased uh, theme or claim in this, in this talk is that factor graphs provide a lingua franca in which these very challenging aerial, uh, underwater and space robotics applications um, can be described and, and, and reasoned about in a common framework. So what is a factor graph? Well, a factor graph is uh, something that we've been working on for a while. Factor graphs were not invented uh, by, by, by my group. Um, they've been around in machine learning and they capture very well this local sensor fusion problem that is the key in many of these challenging robotics domains. So. So let's, let's, let's jump in. So you have a, a robot, and the robot uh, observes a landmark in the environment. Well, that can be captured by introducing two unknowns, one for the robot, where is the robot, one for the landmark, you know, what is the nature of the landmark, where is the landmark, and a, a different type of node, which is a factor that encodes the probabilistic knowledge that a measurement uh, endows the robot with, right? And so uh, the robot takes a step and then the step is measured by an odometry measurement that gives an indication as to how two time steps uh, relate. So the, the, the location of the robot at time one and the location of the robot at time two. And then we, we take some more measurements now of, of uh, another landmark uh, enters the picture and, and this continues and we build a full factor graph that encodes this sensor fusion problem. Uh, and in many cases, this then gives rise to a least squares uh, optimization problem uh, that can be solved using uh, techniques from sparse linear algebra. Factor graphs can represent many robotics problems uh, from tracking to optimal control to sophisticated 3D mapping. So, uh, for example, in a tracking scenario, uh, there is a single mark of chain that encodes the, uh, uh, the, the probabilistic 
uh, knowledge you have about the evolution of the um, of the, the, the subject that you're trying to track, for example, in the Skydio case, uh, you can add you know, discrete variables to that to to think about maneuvering, and, and especially in an aerial context, um, not only when you're tracking a, a subject on the ground, but if you're in a dogfight, for example, and you want to uh, deduce what the other pilot is thinking, then you maybe have a discrete variable representing uh, the intent of the pilot, right? And then based on that, you can phrase your optimal action as a factor graph, where now factors represent uh, things you might want. Uh, you want to stay close to the subject that you're tracking. Um, and uh, now factors can also encode uh, the dynamics that is influenced by, by control and you optimize for the control. There is also on, on the right here, more complicated factor graphs, uh, a pulse graph, a slam graph, and a structure for motion graph, where we reason about the trajectory of the robot at the same time as also thinking about the, uh, the environment and what the environment looks like, right? So, um, Working with factor graphs really exposes opportunities for, for exploiting computational efficiency because of the deep connection between uh, factor graphs and sparse linear algebra. And so to create a uh, performant uh, application in robotics, uh, you can exploit things like ordering heuristics, uh, cutting up graphs in, into, into uh, smaller graphs, uh, recursively is, is a process called nested dissection. You can sparsify graphs with a variety of other techniques, so which people have uh, explored in, in, in the last uh, couple of years. Uh, you can pre-integrate sensor measurements to get sparser graphs, etc., etc. Um, but aside from performance considerations, there is another uh, more subtle but very real benefit to uh, factor graphs, which is that they um, are beneficial when you design and think about your problem. And I've noticed in, in, a, in an industrial uh, setting where in industry and academics meet, uh, it, it really provides a, a great language to, to bridge the gap between, between uh, academics on the one hand and, in, and, and people in industry and on the other hand on, on reasoning and thinking through sensor fusion problems in a particular uh, application domain. I've seen this uh, uh, time and time again uh, in, 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 in several companies that, I, that I've worked. Uh, here's a simple example, and I've shown this, this graphic uh, a couple of times, uh, so I apologize if you've seen this uh, before. But in, in simultaneous localization and mapping, or SLAM, we're interested in inferring the trajectory of the robot and a map of the unknown environment, okay? And if you, if you uh, think about all measurements at the same time, uh, so you, 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 know, you, you, you view the entire graph of this problem, you get insight into the nature of the problem. So here you see a trajectory uh, connected to a number of landmarks, and you can see that this is not a fully connected graph, this is a sparse graph, and the sparsity tells you something about the nature of your problem. Uh, a powerful concept that we've developed over the last couple of years is also inspired by linear algebra, which is the fact that uh, you can think about incrementally computing the solution to a problem. So if new measurement information comes in, you don't really have to you know, invert all matrices involved in the li li linear least squares problem, for example, all over again, you can use incremental factorization, for example, which we have uh, formalized in a, in a data structure called the base tree. And the base tree is nothing but a uh, directed uh, junction tree, which encapsulates the knowledge about all the variables that you have encountered in, in the past uh, trajectory of the robot, uh, for example, uh, where were the people, where were other platforms, where was I, what's the environment like. And you can capture the knowledge over all these things, given your all the measurements that you have about this, uh, the, these, these unknowns, into a directed tree. And the cool thing is that 
uh, incremental factorization can be seen as editing this tree and it's a very local operation in most cases okay so so here is a, a uh, an animation that michael case made when when he did this work uh, with me a, a couple of years ago of a uh, a slam problem this is a simulated slam problem and you can see that the base tree is is developing over time uh, but only the red parts here have to be updated and the rest can be conceivably even swapped out to disk and, and, and loaded back into memory when, when you need it. Um, this allows you also to, to uh, defer marginalization um, it, you know, in principle forever. Uh, and marginalization is very well known to have an adverse effect on, on the, the consistency of, of your estimates, uh, for example, in, in, in the slam problem. Okay, so uh, this was a very successful algorithm. It is still a, a very successful algorithm. And uh, a movie that I always like to see uh, or like to show show off is, is the movie by A. Young Kim uh, when she was a grad student in uh, Ryan Eustis, uh, or a postdoc, I, I should say. She did this work when she was already a postdoc in Ryan Eustis uh, lab at Michigan. To, to inspect the hull of a, an aircraft carrier. And so she um, worked on, on, especially the front ends, there is a lot of complicated uh, sonar pre-processing that needs to happen and reasoning about when you should try to do loop closures, etc. cetera. Um, and so um, this is really one of the most exciting sort of applications of ISAM, um, at least that, that I know of, there are many others that, that uh, are buried uh, or secret within companies. Um, a Young is now a, a professor at, uh, at, at KAIST uh, and, and she is still using ISAM in an, in an urban uh, mapping uh, environment uh, for autonomous driving. Um, another uh, uh, application of uh, ISAM and factor graphs is uh, the treatment of inertial measurement. So, especially in an aerial context uh, and, and, and definitely in an underwater context where, where these magical sensors like GPS, uh, absolute location is not readily available. Um, you, would, you would want to be as good as you can in, in treating inertial measurements. And so um, uh, Christian Forster and, and Luca Carlone, when they were um, uh, visiting Georgia Tech, have, have collaborated on um, uh, bringing ISAM together with an idea that was already pre-existing, which is a pre-integration of inertial measurements, which was uh, developed at the University of Sydney. And with that, they, they built a state-of-the-art uh, VIO system, visual inertial odometry system, um, that, that uh, really um, that beat the state-of-the-art at the time it was published. Um, that, that field is evolving very quickly. Um, what is novel in the last couple of years is that factor graphs also turn out to be really beneficial when you're looking at uh, optimal control and, and in, in particular in, in a robotics context at motion planning. So when you're tracking uh, people and you try to follow them with a drone, well, you could think about the motion planning problem uh, in a factor graph context as well. And so... Uh, in, in joint work with, uh, with my colleague at Georgia Tech, now at the University of Washington, Byron Boots, and, and our students, we, we looked at motion planning in a uh, mobile manipulator context. Um, and uh, especially the, the base tree, putting the base tree together with motion planning, you get fast incremental replanning. Uh, so it turns out to be a very, uh, very good match uh, as well. Um, that was kinematic planning, and uh, I just want to highlight uh, some work that my PhD student, uh, Mandy Chi, uh, did recently, which was also thinking about the dynamics of, of robots, which of course is, is quite important in a, uh, in, in a, for example, in the context of, of space, uh, where there is very predictable dynamics. Well, you can take all these dynamics and also encode them in, in factor graphs. Uh, this is a, a factor graph that, that is about a, a, the dynamics of a mobile manipulator, but you can apply it in many different contexts. Um, 
And so you can do Kino dynamic motion planning um, as well and, and put it together with uh, perception. So uh, sort of a final technical slide here is that we can put perception and planning together in the same graph and simply advance a pointer in time when the plan has been executed partially. Uh, we can take a look at the new measurements that come in revise our estimate of what actually happened and based on that immediately replan in the future as to what the optimal course of action is. Um, and so that's a steep or simultaneous uh, estimation of trajectories and planning, right? Uh, so this is again uh, work by Mustafa Mukadam and, and, and Jing Dong and, and, uh, and others in, in uh, Georgia Tech. Uh, I just want to conclude uh, with uh, an outlook. Um, obviously, I, I believe that in perception and in planning, uh, factor graphs can be uh, a great tool um, in all the domains um, that, that we discussed. Um, in aerial uh, autonomy, airborne autonomy, uh, I believe the outlook is very positive. Uh, I think we're on the cusp of a revolution in uh, aerial robotics, and I think Skydio is at the forefront of this revolution. Uh, but we'll also see increasingly um, the deployment, the actual deployment of uh, drone delivery products. So here is a, uh, an early uh, concept from, from Wing, uh, and there is a, uh, the Amazon uh, uh, delivery drone as well. Um, it's, it's actually um, a relatively um, easy space to work in, in the sense that uh, the airspace is relatively uncluttered. Um, uh, and if, if, a, if a drone crashes, um, it's lightweight and, and typically will have uh, non-lethal consequences. So, so maybe this is sort of the first uh, frontier in which uh, autonomy will have a, a large uh, a large role in the future. Now, um, nevertheless, even a small drone, you don't want it to be falling out of the sky randomly and in random locations. Uh, and so uh, safe, assured autonomy is a, is a key uh, topic for research. We are working in a collaboration with, with Stanford and, and many others in a NASA funded effort to, um, to reason about uh, safe autonomy in, in air in air spaces. Uh, and, and so I believe that factor graphs there have a, a great role as well in the sense that we can use probabilistic reasoning to safeguard and monitor uh, and, and recover from mistakes that might be made with, uh, with novel, uh, highly performant, but novel and, and, uh, and slightly risky uh, applications of say deep learning, right? So deep learning, the, the big Achilles heel of deep learning is that it is often um, a black box and we're not trying to open the black box, but you also want systems around that to, um, to put the black box into a safe box, right? In underwater robotics, I believe deep learning is in fact going to be the key to, to, uh, to progress because um, Things like the absence of GPS means that absolute location uh, or localization is difficult. So you have to rely on other sensors. These sensors are uh, complicated both by, by the nature of them. Uh, so sonar is a, is a um, people say imaging sonar, but it's really the process that image is a process, um, the product of a, of a, of a pre-processing step that is, uh, that is not easy. Uh, and it's also not easy to um, deal with a very specific and sort of strange noise characteristics of sonar. Um, there is also a lot of sensor aliasing that goes on. For example, in a, in a forward-looking sonar, uh, you can, you can uh, reason about range and about um, uh, the azimuth, but, but, uh, but your, your elevation... Um, uh, is, is sort of collapsed in a single uh, sheet. And so now um, you have to take that into, in, into account when you build the sensor models, right? Um, here I show a couple of images from, from uh, a CMU Michigan collaboration where they used 
convolutional neural networks to, to think about saliency, uh, really a, uh, uh, a continuation of the work by, by A. Young Kim that I talked about before. Um, and here are some images on the, on the right, also from a, a paper with a very cute title called Deep Learning from Shallow Dives, uh, also from, from A. Young Kim's lab at, at KAIST, um, where she and her students used uh, style transfer to mimic the characteristics of, uh, of sonar. Uh, but I think this is really just the tip, uh, no pun intended, of the iceberg. Um, uh, convolutional neural networks and, and, and neural networks in general, uh, I believe, could be deployed much more um, advantageously to, to, to truly unlock the potential of these uh, complicated uh, sonars. So, we shouldn't see the, their outcomes as, as pure images. We should really go to the, the source of the signal, which is a, which is a sonar sensor. In space robotics, uh, the logistics are, of course, very challenging. Uh, but then the dynamics are very predictable. And here, uh, the work that I discussed earlier about incorporating dynamics in a factor of context seems like a clear opportunity. Uh, at Georgia Tech, we, we, uh, we're... Uh, I'm, I'm working with a colleague of mine, uh, Panos Tsiotras, um, about um, providing uh, situational awareness to people, uh, astronauts working in close collaboration with robots in, in satellite servicing missions and, and, and other missions. Um, and uh, we think that so incorporating dynamics in, in factor graphs and multiple factor graphs is a, is a, is a great way to go about this. Um, all right, so that's that's my very biased outlook on uh, aerial, uh, marine, and uh, space robotics. And uh, I'm, of course, um, bringing my outlook from the perception side, but I want to say again, uh, factor graphs also, I think, have a clear role to play uh, in, in motion planning and action. And I think the, the big wins will come when they, you put to the, the two of them together as in uh, the work that we did with Steep. Um, so uh, thank you for watching and uh, I hope you enjoy IROS and uh, this session. All right.